Um, so when I came to look at the somewhat grandiose title that I'd given Hillary uh, for this presentation, I wondered what on earth I was thinking of. And, uh, but I've decided to stick with it. Um, and I'm going to bring out three key words from the title before we dive in. Um, basically, I want to make this worth everybody's while. This is a point at which we can think about Brexit in a slightly uh, pause and contemplative moment, I guess. That's what I would like this next half hour or so to be, and I'm looking forward to the discussions afterwards. So first and foremost, the future. Well, a key point I want to make in this presentation is that it's extraordinarily difficult to think about the future in Northern Ireland. Uh, we've become conditioned or uh, socialised to think about it in very stark terms, at least in political uh, discourse. And I think that this is why we're having a problem now when we're trying to contemplate the implications of Brexit and how to navigate that. Uh, so I want this paper to explore the reasons for this in some way and then try and plot a way beyond this. Um, albeit in a slightly challenging way. Another word I want to bring out from the title is philosophical. And perhaps when I gave the title, I was hoping maybe I could possibly reflect on the uh, nature of knowledge about borders and nationalism, etc., etc. And there are many people in this room who'd be very well qualified to do that. Instead, I think what might be more useful is to think about a philosophical approach as being one that's calm and unflustered and uh, to think about the current crises that we're facing, and I do believe they are crises, in a way that um, considers things on the basis of evidence and also on the basis of reflection. And then the final word to bring out from this title to set up the paper is frictionless. And I've written quite a lot recently about frictionless borders and the fact that that's possibly an oxymoron. And in leaving the European Union, what we're doing is taking the UK out of an environment in which frictionless borders are um, an objective. Um, we may talk about frictionless borders and technology in the discussion. I'd be happy to do that. Um, I'm not going to, to unpick or unravel that in detail today. Um, I want to begin with a quotation that I came across recently from members of the Irish political elite. Um, and I think it sums up where we are right now in many ways. So the short-term focus of British policy, um, confined to crisis management, makes an already dangerous situation worse. Increasing frustration at the state of political paralysis, uncertainty as long-term British intentions, and growing mutual mistrust between both sections of the community. Now, these words were actually extracted from the Northern Ireland from the New Ireland Forum Report, 1984. <laughs> and so let's take comfort from that. Um, maybe there's a rehearsal in these same uh, uh, conditions of paralysis and uncertainty, um, the dangerous effects that British policy um, or uh, ambiguity is having within Northern Ireland right now. Um, but not long after, of course, the New Ireland uh, Forum, we had a significant uh, breakthrough in relations within Northern Ireland and indeed between these islands. Um, one person who, was, who gave evidence uh, to the New Ireland Forum was Richard Carney. And um, some 12 years later, he published Post Nationalist Ireland. Um, this book was very significant uh, for me. I was in the middle of my studies at McGee at the time, and it seemed to offer a kind of a, a new perspective and a, a very rich perspective on these uh, otherwise polarised and simplistic <laughs> debates that seemed to be going uh, around and around at the time. And I did my undergraduate dissertation on, on the idea of post-nationalist Ireland. Uh, Carney was um, generous enough to allow me to interview him as, as did Garrett Fitzgerald um, as a young undergrad in McGee. And, uh, and then I went on to do the PhD on a similar topic about reimagining Ireland um, in the context of European integration. So of course it's back to the forefront of my mind now um, about what a reimagination of our situation now might look like. And maybe there's a possibility in all this crisis to think about things in, in new ways, in fresh ways. And indeed to go further than we did in, in 1998. 
So Kearney was writing at the time, and he talked about the capability of Britain and Ireland of reimagining their legacies and the way they choose to conceive of their histories um, in light of the present crises that were being faced, obviously focusing particularly at the time on the conflict and future possibilities. And that's what I would like to do in this presentation. And I would want to do so by looking at two questions. So one is to think about um, uh, this question of, well, why is it so difficult for us to come up with those flexible and imaginative solutions that the European Council has asked us to, to come up with? Um, and I want to unpick that a little bit in relation to three things that I think are a legacy not just of the conflict, but indeed of the agreement itself and the way that the agreement was conceived and, and presented to us. Um, so first and foremost, the difficulty of finding flexibility and imagination in all of this um, arises from the fact, as I mentioned, we're being extracted from the European context, which has facilitated flexibility and imagination, and indeed a little bit of blurring and, um, and ignoring. Um, the second point is that of intractable nationalisms and the way in which this has come to the fore in the context of Brexit and indeed that within Northern Ireland, intractable nationalisms have become entrenched. I'm not gonna to go too much into that, but just to pick up on the implications of that for our current situation. And then the third issue about why it's so difficult to think of the future in Northern Ireland. And I may explore a little bit this idea of negative silence, which I've written about before, um, about the fact that people don't have the words to think about or to um, describe the future for Northern Ireland. Um, in ways that they may be able to do in, in other regions of Europe. And then the second thing I want to do is get onto the question of, well, what do we need to do now? And this is because I want to ensure that we are equipped to be able to respond to some of these, uh, these challenges um, uh, by knowing what possibilities may exist. Um, I want to... Uh, to equip you to address that silence with ideas and with thoughts and to possibly think in imaginative ways. I think all of us have something to contribute here. And I think too often, um, most um, apparent now, is a shutting down, not just of debate, but of course of expertise in relation to, to Brexit and its implications. And uh, I would like to just give some ideas about how we might tackle these challenges now. Okay, so the first question, why is it so difficult? So, somebody likened uh, leaving the European Union, sorry, I'm not sure what's coming up on the screen, sorry. Um, it's more or less the same as it was when I, when I made this, a couple of differences. Uh, what, one difference there is that the title is missing. So the, the title is Unbaking a Cake. So somebody likened Brexit to the process of unbaking a cake. Now I suspect that for many of the Brexiteers, um, they thought that leaving the European Union would be like taking the icing off the cake. Because the way that they see European integration is that it's supranational, it's above the nation state, it's transcended it in some ways. I don't feel European, I don't have a European identity that's beyond my national identity, therefore we can set it aside and, and, uh, and move on or, or backwards or wherever you want to go. Um, so it, this is based on a fundamental m misconception of what European integration is because it doesn't transcend national identity at all. It transforms it. And in very practical and pragmatic ways, that's the whole logic of it. If it didn't, then people wouldn't want to be part of the European Union. Uh, it has to be seen to have a pragmatic, practical benefit uh, for all those involved. Um, this is very clear, of course, in the Irish case. Um, and particularly around the Irish border region. The pragmatic effects and benefits of European integration have been very clearly felt in what has become more or less uh, a fairly frictionless border. And I've written quite a bit on this in the past about the way that European integration has been mediated and, and, um, and shaped by national preferences and nationalisms in many ways, but ultimately these have all been transformed. Um, in, in, in certain ways. So when we think about uh, the difference that the European Union has made to the Irish border, um, then we perhaps begin to find some grounds for those flexible and imaginative solutions. 
Um, so let's think first and foremost what difference European integration has made. Let's set aside some of the rhetoric for the time being and just think, well, what, 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 is, what has been the benefit or the effects of European integration? And part of the difficulty, I think, in trying to conceive of the future for, for Ireland after Brexit, for Northern Ireland after Brexit, is because it's actually very difficult to explain what normalisation means or what normal everyday practices, the things that we don't critique or make a big deal about. Um, those are the, th that's been the main effects of this process of European integration and of course of the peace process in the border region. Above all else, the European Union has depoliticised cross-border cooperation and this has been to the benefit not just of nationalists but of unionists too. Um, the second key point of course, is trade. That's a fundamental logic of European integration, that in very visible or invisible ways, um, if you like, the removal of the customs posts, uh, the removal of the need for customs checks, the harmonization of trading standards, etc. Common membership of the single market has meant that uh, the, uh, the experience of crossing the Irish border has been transformed. This too, of course, has had an effect on citizens and citizens' experience. And it's not just something that can be held on to by holding on to Irish citizenship after Brexit, because a lot of the benefits that are felt by, from European integration to citizens are um, particular um, to being part of a, a European member state, residing in a member state. And there are a lot of tricky questions to be dealt with through the Brexit process, for example, about the protection of frontier workers and their families and the special rights that they have um, through EU citizenship. Um, sorry, and then the fi final issue, sorry you can't see it quite so well, is, is the process of European integration forming closer union, which is a slightly uh, controversial phrase. Um, notably, of course, David Cameron managed to get that dropped in what he'd negotiated with the EU, that they weren't going to use that phrase <laughs> anymore. Um, so they don't have to do that now with Brexit. But this idea of closer union kind of makes sense in many ways. It's not just about... Um, where the European Union is going, but it's about fundamental security cooperation, uh, cooperation in relation to education and research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, all of this closer union is intended in part to, or has part of it, addressing the needs of peripheral regions and locations, and the, Euro and the European membership has had very specific benefits, therefore, <coughs> to the Irish border region uh, and to Northern Ireland. Um, so leaving the European Union brings threats across all these areas. Um, and a fundamental question for us now is, how many of these issues are we prepared, or how many of these benefits, say, or effects, do we want to see gone, or would we like to see preserved? And notably, the political parties of all shades in Northern Ireland have said, actually, we like things pretty much as they are. So maybe some of us want to leave the European Union, but we'd like to retain all of these benefits, all of these effects. Um, and this is a tricky thing that we have to navigate now. How much flexibility is there within the European Union to allow us to keep some of these benefits, some of these effects, and to preserve them? Um, uh, we'll come back to that. Of course, it will also re require flexibility on the part of the, Europe of the United Kingdom and compromise on both parties. Okay, the second issue as to why it's difficult to think about the future of Northern Ireland is that intractable nationalisms have come to the fore. So what's fascinating to watch across the UK, across Britain, is the polarisation that has happened of the population, almost half and half. Um, people absolutely staunch on their position vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. And this is an expression of intractable nationalism when it comes to to Brexitian logic. And it's not too surprising, really. I mean, one thing that's worth reflecting on is when Richard Carney was writing, and, and others, many others, um, about the situation in Northern Ireland in the mid, uh, early 1990s, um, they bemoaned the way in which Northern Ireland represented the, the damage caused by um, uh, sort of a, a very simplistic, reductionist version um, of nationalism, and we're seeing the very same thing across the UK today. Of course, we're very familiar with such uh, nationalist positions within Northern Ireland and the damage that they can do, and the 2017 election demonstrated that once more. Um, and 
if we think about the way that the election played out, that snap election played out within Northern Ireland, we just have a rehearsal of these intractable nationalisms that have become very much embedded and, and uh, uh, familiar, of course. I just want to take a quick look at two of the manifestos from Northern Ireland, um, two very small extracts from those manifestos, but to make a couple of points about these. So when we see these um, outlining of these intractable nationalisms, some claims are being made in these manifestos. Um, the first claim is that they are, it's in relation to a, a fundamentalist, very straightforward, unequivocal expression of a nationalist point of view. Um, the second key point is that they're taking um, opposing stances on Brexit. And the third key point is that each party is wanting to put itself across as the, uh, the best defender of that nationalist position and therefore the best defender of the interests vis-a-vis the, the European Union. So the DUP, therefore, presents Brexit, presents the election as the key opportunity to make a positive case for the Union. Um, Brexit ultimately is about the United Kingdom and the Union of, that, uh, of the UK. And uh, Theresa May would have been um, uh, reassured to see the, the, the emphasis upon the strength, the strong, strong party of the DUP coming out in this manifesto too. The DUP is, will be the strongest voice for, for unionism in the UK and vis-a-vis -vis Brexit. And what's, uh, what, what happens, therefore, is the, the more moderate parties, the UUP, also gets pulled into that whole debate. Who's the strongest to defend unionism? And the UUP's manifesto was very strong on Brexit and um, very unequivocal about not wanting special status for Northern Ireland. Second manifesto, Sinn Féin. Again, it's, it's very much about Brexit as seen through the light of this intractable nationalism. Um, and re repeating the same points about not being able to trust British policy and about defending the interests of Irish nationalism vis-a-vis -vis Britain. Um, and this, oppose, this, therefore, um, this is an opportunity now to uh, stand strong for, for Irish nationalism in this very uncertain time. I think one thing to be clear is that it's very far, this rehearsal of intractable nationalism is very far from the original intention of the 1998 agreement. Um, but possibly one might argue, and have argued in the past, that the roots of this setting out of these two very opposing positions are actually in the agreement itself. And that's in the form of the, of the border poll. Um, and just to make a, a quick point about that, um, it's unsurprising and completely understandable that calls for the border poll would have been made so quickly after the result of the referendum. Um, and certainly it's understandable and important perhaps that the Irish government has ensured that Brussels will recognise, as explicitly stated, as, this, as has um, the UK government, that they would recognise any result from, the border, from a border poll in the future and enable Northern Ireland to rejoin if you like, the European Union through uh, Irish unification. But fundamentally to call for the border poll is um, playing into the same majoritarian logic. So what you are saying is I object to the imposition of the will of a majority um, on a substantial minority in relation to Brexit and therefore I want to redraw the border in some way and impose the will of another majority on another significant minority. And this is not the foundation for, for, for peaceful and good relations. We need to go way beyond that to have a, a reimagination of these relations, of these nationalisms, if you like, in, in very different ways. Um, now, I had some graphs here, <laughs> and they've disappeared. So you're just going to have to trust me <laughs> on this. Um, there were a couple of just, they weren't very, weren't very important, but they were kind of interesting in that what I was trying to do is look back at, there's a couple of questions that have been asked in most Northern Ireland Life and Time surveys for, for, for years now. They haven't asked them uh, since 2014. And the question is, um, if the majority of people in Northern Ireland ever voted to become part of United Ireland, uh, do, you, do you think, you know, how, how do you feel about that? 
Um, or if, if Northern Ireland never voted to become part of United Ireland, how do you feel about that? Um, and the results are very interesting. And the key point I wanted to get across through this graph um, is that, uh, unsurprisingly, for the question about if a majority of people ever voted to become part of United Ireland, a significant portion of the Protestant respondents would say they would find that impossible to accept. Um, but in response to the same question, 80% of Catholic respondents in um, 1999 were saying they would be very happy to accept the will of the majority. But in more recent times, uh, since the early 2000s, this has dropped significantly to about 59% or so or less, saying they'd be happy to accept the will of the majority. And many more Catholics are saying they would find it hard to accept, but they'd be willing to go along with it. Now, this is very interesting, because one point I'm almost blue in the face trying to um, encourage my students to think about, and indeed um, journalists as well, is not drawing the, the, uh, an, um, a direct line between denominational um, affiliation and a political viewpoint. And this NILT survey question um, and a response to that question really highlights that very clearly. Uh, we could speculate as to why that might be. Maybe um, uh, the Catholic respondents are more happy to say, or, or less happy with the idea of a united Ireland because they're happier with Sinn Féin representing the nationalist position within Northern Ireland. I, I don't know. Um, but it's an interesting finding, and it's one that we should bear in mind um, when we think about what a border poll might mean. Um, by far... Uh, the majority of people are, see, are happier and consistently so from 1999 to more recent times with the idea of uh, um, uh, things remaining as they are, the status quo devolution uh, within the UK. The question now posed by Brexit and by what we're facing is, well, what happens if the UK doesn't exist? That, that's a bigger question. <laughs> okay, and then on to this issue of um, future-oriented thinking. Um, I'm not going to go into this for, for a matter of time, but I think in an environment in which ideas of the future are continually dominated by the so-called constitutional question, this has a negative effect on being able to think about uh, much more rich and practical issues uh, for, for the region itself, to think about Northern Ireland as, as, as a region um, with, with its own economic needs, political needs, etc., etc. Um, I'll skip over this a little bit. And I just want to highlight a concern that I've had for a long time. Um, perhaps things are changing a little bit now. Perhaps Brexit has had a positive effect in, in um, generating uh, a response from, from younger people. But some uh, work that I've been doing, and indeed in my privileged position as a, as a lecturer, being able to do with younger people, um, the so-called agreement generation, people who were in primary school or, or born around the time of the agreement, is to think about, well, what future they see for Northern Ireland? How do they talk about Northern Ireland in the future? And um, consistently, um, the finding has been that they find it difficult to talk about it. And there is some of these quotes sort of show that. Essentially, there's a silence about the future. Um, and it's partly a legacy of conflict, of course, that there's this feeling that we don't want to talk about the past and we're worried if we talk about the future, it immediately becomes embroiled in the constitutional question and therefore we just don't talk about it at all. And this is concerning in many ways. I don't think it's the same as apathy. I think it's different. I think it's um, a sort of... Um, Fundamentally, it's a sort of disempowerment, and it's very concerning in terms of the civic engagement of these younger people and what it means for the future for Northern Ireland, um, those who uh, managed to stay. Okay. So I'm going to go on to what's, what's needed now. So what, what should we be talking about when we're thinking about the future of the border after Brexit? And I want to just raise some, some, some suggestions here. Okay. So first and foremost, what we need is agreement. That's quite obvious. Uh, Davis, Coveney, and Barnier, they're, they're already quite publicly disagreeing on a number of matters. Let's think about what they're saying in relation to the border uh, and Northern Ireland. So they concur 
on some fundamental things that I'm very relieved to see they do agree on. That is that the peace process needs to be protected. The European Council and the European Parliament have been very explicit in saying that. Um, that the Good Friday Agreement needs to be upheld uh, in, 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 all its, uh, in a holistic way, which gives us some room now. And they've all been clear that they want to avoid a hard border. Okay. What they have diverged on, firstly, this idea of uh, what they want to preserve. So it's a small point, but I think it's revealing. If you look at the discourse from the United Kingdom when they talk about preserving the integrity of something, they use the phrase in the Brexit white paper and, and speeches, the preserving the integrity of the immigration regime of the United Kingdom. So that's the fundamental approach to Brexit. It's about immigration. It's about taking back control of borders. And uh, this is something that they have put forward now um, as, as being a red line. Um, uh, this creates some, therefore, this sort of helps us understand why their attention hasn't necessarily been drawn to the implications of Brexit in terms of trade and citizenship, et cetera, et cetera, for the Irish border, because they thought common travel area, no problem. We can preserve the integrity of our immigration regime through Brexit. That's all fine. Um, of course, on the other hand, the European Union is wanting to preserve the integrity of its legal order and of the customs union. This is an extremely different take on borders and uh, it does have very fundamental implications for managing the Irish border itself, uh, which we may come back to. Um, then, of course, the issue of frictionless. Um, David Davis, Theresa May, rehearsed this idea of seamless and frictionless borders. Uh, Barnier has been very explicit, including in his address to the Eruptus, saying uh, you can't have frictionless borders outside of the European Union. Uh, you leave the EU, you've got friction. <laughs> and uh, Therefore, we've seen a change in the UK government discourse, so it's interpreting frictionless as being invisible. And uh, um, I'm not going to go into this now, but I have deep concerns about what invisible borders may mean to us, um, and something that we actually should be much more alert to and concerned about, I think. That in invisibility does not mean uh, that they don't exist. And this is the case not just, I'm not just talking about the UK, but across the European Union as a whole. Invisible bordering is happening in a very real way and has very significant consequences for citizenship and for, for privacy and for rights. Um, so talking more positively about what the future border may look like, this term territorial differentiation, which doesn't really roll off the tongue, but I think it has there's some potential here. So let's just outline a couple of the uh, alternatives that are, that are being put forward and think about what they may mean for us. So the first form of territorial differentiation is that of internal differentiation. Now I'm wanting to give this to you because um, I've heard experts in, in high places um, say, well, the EU is a sort of a unitary body. It doesn't want any diversity within its, um, within its realm. That's absolutely not true. And uh, there's a lot of differentiated experience, if you like, of the EU or membership of the EU. And there is potential there for us to uh, uh, find solutions for, for the Irish border after Brexit. Um, we just need to find the right combination of ones. Okay. So the first issue is, well, Northern Ireland could secede from the UK um, border poll or, or otherwise. Um, that's one way of remaining within the EU. Um, for obvious reasons, that's not, not a big runner on all sides. Another suggestion is that the UK could remain a member of the European Union, and then England and Wales can, can uh, make their way out. And uh, Brendan O'Leary has put forward this idea in the so-called Dariada document. And it would uh, get us around some of the fundamental practical difficulties about representation uh, in the European Council and the like. There are ways around this. Uh, straightforwardly, though, it does, not, it does not fit. It's not going to run very far. Uh, um, with, with, with the Tory government. Uh, another suggestion is that the UK can leave the EU, uh, but Northern Ireland and Scotland can remain in the so-called reverse Greenland solution. Um, the difficulty with all of these, of course, is that it doesn't get us around the question of the border, because if you, uh, essentially what you're doing is bringing in a European Union board, an external border of the EU, within the United Kingdom. And 
in some ways it solves some problems, but it creates many more. Many more. Another way about, uh, of going about this is external differentiation. So this is the way that the European Union can have relationships with other territories, other regions that are outside EU member, uh, the European Union itself, um, but that have special arrangements, if you like. Um, so the most obvious one that's been talked about a lot um, is, the, is that of uh, membership of the European Economic Area, uh, saying the same part of the single market that that would allow for. And uh, John Temple Lang and David Finnamore and other colleagues of mine in Queens have put forward this is a suggestion and a very well considered suggestion from Northern Ireland being able to remain in the EEA, or sorry, be part of the EEA, remain in the single market that way. It, it, it does solve some issues. It also, again, creates other issues in that you will have the customs border in the Irish Sea for what, whatever that might mean, and it doesn't relate to agriculture either. And there are all sorts of other issues. Um, then customs union, could there be a customs union arrangement uh, for Northern Ireland with the EU? Again, this is being explored, um, but again, you have the same issue about where that customs border will be. Um, another possible arrangement is that of uh, taking up some of the very unique and bespoke arrangements that the European Union has with some um, unusual territories and regions. So Kaliningrad is a nice example of that. So it's a Russian enclave in Polish territory. And they have uh, arrangements called, it's unsexily called a local border traffic zone, but it essentially allows free movement between Kaliningrad and, and the surrounding areas across an EU external border. Um, I was quite excited when I was looking into this until um, researching a little bit more deeply, and I discovered that it's highly subject to uh, national political whims. So currently, because relations with Russia are not very good, Kaliningrad and the Kaliningrad border is, has been one of the first places to experience a, a clamping down of those relations and a sort of um, pulling back of this openness of the border. So um, that's of some concern. But anyway, it's, it's, it shows you that there's bespoke arrangements possible. And they relate to freedom of movement in, in very real ways. And then there's a whole myriad of um, arrangements with microstates, overseas territories and regions that, that happen within the EU. Northern Cyprus is an, is an interesting example um, in that it can be counted as part of the EU for certain, in certain ways. Um, uh, so um, produce within Northern Cyprus, which is not part of the EU, it's part of Turkey, can be counted as, um, as EU produce. Um, there's potential there to, for, for mirroring similar, um, uh, similar models within Northern Ireland. Uh, but of course it's a very different border, it's a pretty hard border and um, we still have the question of how we'd, how we'd monitor and, and manage that border, even if we had this kind of bespoke arrangement. But what do these tell us um, as we get towards the conclusion? Well, there are other ways of looking at these. We can take the examples of territorial differentiation and we can say, well, what's, what's in this that we may be able to bring forward into our particular situation? Um, other possibilities for new types of differentiation within the European Union. Are there possible for, is it possible to have differentiation that's not based on territory? I think territory can be highly problematic um, as, a, as a grounds for differentiation. Could we think about that multi-layered, multi-stranded model that we've got from the agreement and, and, and think about new relationships with the European Union on those different, um, on those different bases in relation to people, for example? Um, also, are there ways of going beyond using this idea of differentiation to go beyond binaries? So not, you know, not British or Irish, but both. What might that mean in real terms? Can it relate to things other than people? Um, and there's been interesting proposals put forward recently about rules of origin um, within Northern Ireland. Could it be both EU and UK? Um, I think from Cyprus' example, there would be some possibility of that working. Um, could there be sector-specific arrangements um, that would enable flows to happen where it's most important for, for, for trade and for the economy and indeed for jobs um, and uh, for indeed pres preserving good relations um, and, and trade between Britain and Ireland? Is there a possibility of seeing 
greater subsidiarity, more regional diversity within the United Kingdom, possibly as a means of preserving the UK, who knows. Uh, but the proposals put forward from London about having a regional-based immigration policy within London itself, could we use that here? Could we, could we make more of it in Northern Ireland? Um, uh, we've, got the, we've got some institutions, could they be enhanced? Uh, looking for political will first and foremost, and then for, for the legal basis for this. Uh, what potential is there to expand? And again, linking into particular sectors. But all of this has to be done on the basis of evidence. Let's bring in the evidence, let's bring in the economics, and let's not let it be dominated by uh, discourse from, from, from those intractable nationalist and unionist positions. <clears throat> there are several challenges. You're probably already thinking of them now. Um, but fundamentally, there's a couple of key things that we need to be aware of. So one is that the EU is willing to see flexibility and imagination in them. Um, in relation to Northern Ireland, but it has to premise all of this on the peace process. Now, we could be very cynical about this, or we could be genuine, and it goes back to that whole issue of how the European Union has benefited Northern Ireland and has affected the peace process. In many, many ways, it can't be traced and, and, um, and, and, and evidenced in, in simplistic ways that we'd like to, such as, the, such as those tick boxes. <coughs> But if we can make the case to sort of show how this environment has facilitated the peace process, uh, there are possibilities here. And in, in so doing, we need to make sure that the peace process isn't seen to be a Northern Ireland issue. It's about these islands. It's not even just an Irish issue. It's about these islands itself. Um, how to ensure flexibility within the EU, that's the way to do it. <clears throat> how to equip the institutions to cope with these new arrangements, that needs political will. Um, and resourcing, and it needs forward planning, of course, as well. A fundamental issue is how to find the political will, especially when both main parties within Northern Ireland see within their grasp a means of getting what they've wanted for, for a very, very long time. Um, at, at what harm to, to uh, diversity within Northern Ireland? <coughs> so... Just to finish with Richard Carney, um, he was talking back then about rethinking the totality of relations. I don't think we got far enough in that rethinking. I think we became complacent. We thought we'd achieved quite a lot with those three strands. Certainly the UK, Britain thought it had, it had done more than its fair share. Um, and it's going to be difficult now <coughs> to... Um, and encourage a rethinking of what it is to be a nation state, what it is to be, <clears throat> um, to uphold a particular culture. The key words here, I think, in Carney's statement <coughs> um, from Post Nationalist Island <clears throat> are um, rethinking and accommodation. And as he says, the important thing at this historical juncture is that we begin to rethink who and what we are not just on both sides of the Irish border, but on both sides of the Irish Sea. <coughs> so to conclude, <coughs> I think to think about the future of national borders across these islands, we need to remember that borders aren't lines of limitation. Uh, they aren't lines at which economic opportunities or security needs or social interactions stop and end. They are meeting points. And similarly, Northern Ireland is not a place apart. It's a bridge between these islands. It's a, very much a meeting point between Britain and Ireland. And now at this critical time, Northern Ireland is a test bed for the durability of the United Kingdom, for the flexibility of the European Union, and for the scope of our political imaginations.